Sola Scriptura, right? There's uh, five cries of the Protestant Reformation. That's when they said, hey, this Pope idea, not so much in the Bible. So the church needs to be fixed. But how do you fix something? Got to have a guide. And the guide to correct the church if it goes astray is not actually the church itself. It's the scripture. Now, yes, the church, is, the church has to interpret and apply the scripture. But that's where we start. Rome has a different authority. Ultimately, it would say, yes, Scripture is part of it, but it's not Scripture alone, which is what Sola Scriptura means. Sola Scriptura, only Scripture, because it is God's inspired word, is our inerrant, sufficient, and final authority for the church. That doesn't mean necessarily that we don't have what you might call subordinate authorities. For example, sometimes we use the London Baptist Confession. That's a subordinate authority. It's a doctrinal standard, and the idea is supposed to be a summary of Scripture, but it's not anywhere near the kind of authority Scripture is. It's different levels. It's subordinate to Scripture. But Scripture is not subordinate to anything because of the author. That's why. So if God is all-knowing and he speaks, he can't have error in his Scripture. You see what I'm saying? If God does not lie and only tells the truth, then Scripture cannot have lies or errors from God. It can only have truth. And so Scripture alone recognizes the role of the Bible in the believers individually and collectively their life. And that's very important because what is your ultimate authority, your final authority, answers so many questions in life. And that's why you'll see... And I know we all make mistakes, but if you've ever heard someone say, you know, I'm divorcing my spouse and they don't have any biblical reason and they'll say something like, well, God wants me to be happy, right? God wants me to be happy or whatever the, the, the thing is. It's because God wants me to be happy. Their ultimate authority really is their, their own perceived happiness, right? They'll try to make God sort of on their team. Boy, that's, that's what God wants too. But it's clear that Scripture is not in charge. And Sola Scriptura is important. And that goes to the the topic of today, which, yeah, you guys will have to, oh, okay, yeah, which is how to learn. So let's go to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, because I don't know if you've noticed the theme, if you've been coming every week, but a theme is uh, that we've been developing is really ultimately the wisdom of God over and against the wisdom of man. That's been the key theme. And you may say, well, how is this apologetics? Because the main thing we're emphasizing in these series is this as the ultimate authority. This is the first thing, the primary thing. You can know all about Jehovah's Witnesses and all their false prophecies, but if you don't know Scripture, you've got it backwards. I'm not saying you shouldn't learn about those kinds of things, whatever God calls you to, but this is first and foremost. And let's look at Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And remember, the Bible is not about being dumb and ignorant. The Bible cherishes and prizes wisdom, right? We should love wisdom here. And this is a beautiful passage. Look what it says here. Trust in the Lord. See, that's all caps, so that's Yahweh. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. A lot of times when we hear heart, we think, oh, that's your, like, emotions, it is your emotions, but that's not all it is, biblically speaking. Heart, mind, soul, strength, everything you are. When the Old Testament especially uses the phrase heart, it doesn't, we, we think sometimes, oh, that's the, the feely, touchy side. Well, your emotions are part of that, but it's not all. And that's why Jesus said, everything's summed up in this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. It's a way to say everything that you are. So this is the way you think, the way you feel, the way you talk. Ever we are. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I told Eric, I told him, he's like, oh, it's going to be fine. If that does it again, will you please get me another mic or turn that one on? I hate temperamental microphones. They, this one's notorious. It, it always cuts out on me. Okay. It's worse than having a, 
<laughs> what's the, uh, I used to have it, not Cox, but the other CenturyLink, man, or what's like having CenturyLink Wi-Fi. All right. This microphone. So you lean not into your own understanding. You're leaning into God's understanding, which is a bigger, better, truer perspective. That's what you lean on. That's your support. That's your comfort. That's your rock. I never learned how to fly a plane, don't want to, but they talk about trust your instruments. And sometimes you'll see when you'll have like a, a pilot, sometimes when you'll hear about a wreck, sometimes it's because they they looked at their senses instead of their instruments. And it's easy, I guess, to get disoriented in a storm and things like that when you're flying a plane. And so you really got to trust the instruments to tell you where you are, if you're going up or down, all that kind of stuff in a bad storm. Sometimes pilots... They don't trust their instruments because it's very instinctive to trust your senses, but especially in a storm where you're disoriented, they can be wrong, and then you crash. This is what this is. Our feelings are fleeting. It's not that they don't matter or don't count for anything, but they are fleeting. Even our thoughts and ideas, they change. We lean upon God and his word, and he has spoken in scripture. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Everything. Our job, if we're going to school, when we learn, Lordship of Christ, and he will make straight your paths. He will make straight your paths. So do you see the, this, this, this way that we trust God first and foremost? And that's how to learn. Next slide, please. That's how to learn. And so when we start to learn, the question is, what's the place you turn to to truly learn? And again, this has been the theme of everything. God's wisdom over and against mere man wisdom. It is scripture. And so first and foremost, we talk about how to how to learn. You have to start with a high view of Scripture. High view of Scripture really just means a proper view of Scripture. There's people that have a low view of Scripture. For example, well, there's parts of the Bible that I don't really listen to because I'm not so sure they're right. They don't sound right. Or, well, that was for then, but it's, but it's outdated. It's a low view of Scripture. Or, of course, well, the Bible was just written by, by men, right? That kind of thing. The people. This is a low view of Scripture. A high view of Scripture is accepting the Bible for what it is. The self-attesting authority directly from God. And so when you say, how do I learn? That's where you start at. And so we submit everything to the Word of God. Now, that's why biblical interpretation matters. Because if you have some things that are wrong... And then you say, well, I'm submitted to the word of God, but you're wrong in that interpretation, then you can get messed up. And that's why Christians, as we go on, also learn what's the big, clear, main ideas. And what are ideas that are important, but not as important? There are levels. There are levels. For example, your view of the end times. There's multiple viewpoints that Christians have about what's going to happen in the end. That is subservient or not as important, ultimately, about your view of who Jesus is. Now, these things all relate, but there has to be levels. And what happened at the cross? But sometimes we get out of order. We think everything is equally important. I'm not saying anything in Scripture is not important. What I'm saying is we have to learn, okay, what is something that's not as clear? Because, for example, if it's in the future, it hasn't happened yet. Christ has already come, though. He has died on the cross. That is something that there has to be much more agreement on. This is something that we can know extremely clear. But we have a high view of Scripture when we begin to study Scripture. And let me show you a key passage for that. Let's turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Go really, uh, not all the way to the back, but close to the back of your Bible. I'm going to switch it if I can. This good old cord and mic, it won't let me down, I don't think. All right, thank you, brother. This sounds better, too. So 2 Timothy, this is, this is the Apostle Paul writing. And this is sometimes what they call his swan song. This is his last letter. 
his last epistle. He knew he was going to die if you read the full letter. And he did shortly die under the persecution of Emperor Nero. He writes his letter to Timothy, a young pastor at, at Ephesus. And it's interesting. What does he tell Timothy to look to? Where does he tell him to go? Where does he tell him to turn? He doesn't talk about the Bishop of Rome or a council or the magisterium. He talks about turning to scripture first and foremost. And so in this context, if we look at 2 Timothy, Paul is talking about persecution. You know, he's writing from prison himself. This is a, a pastoral epistle, meaning it's written to a pastor, but it's also a prison epistle, as in it's written, it's written from prison. And so when we look at 2 Timothy, you know, the context of persecution and all that is very real. It's not hypothetical. It's a real thing. And he talks about that. And Paul also talks in this section about godlessness in the last days. And then he tells Timothy where to turn to, though. Starting in verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go from bad to worst, deceiving and being deceived. So this is what can happen as you embrace false teaching and embrace sin. Often there's a trajectory where it's worse and worse. And then in contrast, Paul is saying, but as for you, young Timothy, continue. So this is something that Timothy's already doing. He's saying, still do it. And that's the Christian life. Maybe uh, two years ago, you were on fire and you had Bible passages memorized and you were in there every day. And now not so much. Continue, ladies and gentlemen. We got to continue. It's not over till it's over. And sometimes we rest on sort of the past and, and all that. That's good but it's continuing, continuing in what you have learned. So we're talking about tonight to how, how to learn. You see, he's saying, you've learned something, Timothy, continue in that. Now he's going to show him the source of that and have firmly believed. That's what I call the pit bull mentality. You know, where a pit bull locks onto something and they don't let go. That jaw locks in, and they got to have like a prying stick sometimes just to get the pit bull off of whatever it is that has a singular focus. It does not let go. It will not let go. You know, like you guys ever, you hold up something, the pit bull jumps and just hangs there, right? Stuff like that. Uh, that's that pit bull mentality. We hold on tightly to Jesus Christ. We don't let go. We hold on tightly to God's word. And you won't always feel like it, but maintain that singular devotion and have firmly believe knowing from whom you learned it. And this is beautiful. Watch verse 15. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So scripture here is sufficient for the most important thing, which is salvation, how to be saved. Do you see that? And this is a beautiful thing. Praise God for testimonies, but also praise God for the testimony that says, when I was young, my mom, when I was young, my dad, when I was young, my uncle, when I was young, my grandpa taught me the Bible, exposed me to the word of God. That's an important thing of what we do with younger people in our life, regardless of child or, or nieces, nephews, whatever it is. From childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So there's this beginning knowledge that Timothy has, even at a young age, which are able to make you wise so we talk about man's wisdom, God's wisdom. The scripture is the source of wisdom, but it's not just wise so you can walk around being wise. Wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. This is the source. And he, look at this next verse. This is a powerful verse, an important verse, a key verse to help us have a high view of scripture. All scripture. All. All scripture. Pantagrapha, I think is what it says in Greek, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is what you need. This is really all you need ultimately. This does not mean don't read other things or don't learn from other sources. This is saying this is the ultimate one, and there's nothing else that can be described as being God-breathed. The Greek word there is theanoustos, theanoustos. It means literally breathed out by God. Now, what, what is that breathed out by God, God breathed? Well, we understand 
Jesus takes on flesh so he has a human nature, so he can breathe in a literal sense. But when we look at the triune God, the Father is not physical. The Holy Spirit's not physical. So God breathed doesn't refer to some, some kind of situation with lungs. But what does it mean that it's God breathed? Understand it's saying the source of Scripture is directly from God himself. As when God would speak, so to speak, that's what the Scripture is. The Scripture is God breathed. And there is nothing else described this way. There is nothing else that is theanustas. Nothing else is God breathed. Scripture alone is God breathed. Verse 17, that the man of God, that the woman of God, that the child of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we believe in the charismatic gifts here. But sometimes you'll have people who run around giving their business cards, you know, their profits, and they'll say, I've got this word for you that you need, but you got to come Wednesday night to hear it. <laughs> and it's something not even in the Bible. <laughs> Invest in energy. What? <laughs> World War III is upon us, you know. But here it says the scripture is what makes you complete. That is what equips you for every good work. Anything else can only supplement that. Anything else is underneath that. The scripture is sufficient. And that's why we say sola scriptura. When I'm done, I got a couple of little booklets and pamphlets I brought. I always like to give stuff away. Here's a good one. It's um it's a it's a brief article specifically about this verse we're reading. God breathed scripture. And then I have some other good ones. Why God gave us a book. See, these are Easy reading, right? These are sort of about the Bible, since that's what we're talking about. Why trust the God of the Bible? And then, if you want to get a little old school, the doctrine of the Word of God. This one's a little more challenging if you want to take that one. And then two other small ones, they're just about how to interpret the Bible, which we're going to talk about at the end. So I got a couple of things, six or so. If you want, let me know, and you can get those when we're done. So 2 Timothy 3.16 is definitely something to have in your back pocket. It Helps you maintain a high view of Scripture. Let's go on to the next one, how to learn. Remember the attributes of Scripture. We're going to get a little systematic theologic in a second here. What that means is that we're going to see the system, the overall picture that the Bible paints for itself, and what a proper doctrine of Scripture is. Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, you guys worship the Bible like it's a fourth member of the Trinity. It's a way to slur people who hold to a high view of Scripture. We don't worship the Bible. We don't you know, put it up here and bow down. And we don't, we, we don't think it's uh, a fourth member of the Trinity. We understand though it's God's words to us that, that that's all we're properly recognizing its authority. And so we have a high view of scripture and we remember what scripture is. Let's look at it. Some of its attributes, some of its characteristics, you know, how uh, maybe um, there's a dog at the pound and it describes the dog. Well, it's a six years old. He bites people. Uh, he's got a tooth missing, right? It's the characteristics of the dog there. So you know what you're getting into. This is the characteristics, the attributes of scripture. So let's look at a couple of those. First and foremost is very similar to what we just talked about. Scripture is inspired. There's going to be seven of these, seven attributes of scripture for you to look at. This simply means all the words of scripture are God's words. All the words of Scripture are God's words, that it's from God. So now other people speak in Scripture, but the idea here is what it's saying is that everything is ultimately behind it. The architect is God himself. And there are lots of places in Scripture where God directly speaks. That's that old KJV, especially in the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord. And that's what the devil the serpent first called into question with Eve and then Adam hath God truly said the very first thing called into question God's word God speaking but scripture is inspired it's saying the source ultimately is God himself John Frame one of my favorite theologians says that God takes words of human beings and makes them his own a divine act creating an identity between a divine word and a human word so God uses prophets and apostles in the process. He does. We don't deny the human element to scripture, but the ultimate superintendent, maybe you want to put it that way, the superintendent behind the scripture is God himself. And so it's not mere human. It's not merely human. 
Scripture is authoritative. Next one, please. Second attribute of Scripture you want to remember. It's authoritative. It's about the authority of Scripture here. Because Scripture is God's word, it is authoritative. It carries the weight of God's command as ruler over all creation. God is sovereign. He's in control. He's in charge. He's not like a president. He's the king and not a mere earthly king, the ultimate king, the king who never abdicates his throne, who has no rivals. Sometimes we think, oh, it's God versus devil, right? Yeah, but even the devil was God's devil, meaning he's a creature. God made him. God can take him out. He sovereignly allows the devil to do what he does now. But the de it's not like a competition, like the Sith of the Jedi, and we don't know who's going to win. God is in charge. And so scripture, when he speaks, he speaks authoritatively. How could the all-knowing, all-God, all-wise God speak any other way other than authoritative? You know, it's not God saying, well, I've got a little advice about that. Uh, here's my opinion, <laughs> right? It's not like that. Westminster Confession of Faith, another classic summary of Protestant Christian doctrine, says this, that scripture is given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. This is what we've been given. Again, there are secondary authorities we recognize, pastors, elders even, but nothing is in the category or the realm of Scripture because the source of Scripture, authority, authoritative. Also, next one, characteristics of Scripture. Scripture is infallible. This is somewhat of a controversial one these days, even amongst Christians. This means that it cannot fail, that it cannot fall. Scripture is God's word, and God cannot lie. Scripture is incapable of erring. It's not an option for the Bible to be wrong. Now, does that mean we don't have challenges? There's places we could go to, and I could say, I am not 100% sure what this means. And that's why uh, sometimes when people bring up what they say are contradictions, I'll refer to them as alleged contradictions or alleged errors or alleged mistakes because they're saying that. I don't recognize that. That doesn't mean we always have the perfect right answer. None of us are infallible, omniscient, or otherwise we'd be God and we could write the Bible ourselves. And so there's a trust there when we talk about infallible and inerrant, which is the next one. It's like this. This is an analogy, but it's not a perfect analogy. It's like if you know someone well. Say it's your one of your a family member. It could be your brother, your sister, husband, wife. It could be someone who's your best friend. You know them well, and you heard they did or said something. You don't immediately jump to, oh, that's what happened. That's it. There's a level of, well, let me see. Let me investigate. Let me let me see. There's a level of trust before you just jump off into, oh, look at what they did. You, you see if that's true or what they meant by that kind of thing. It's not identical, but picture it somewhat of a mother-to-child relationship or husband-to-wife relationship where there's a level of trust because of the relationship. When you approach Scripture, you're not even dealing with a spouse who can err. Because you ever said this? That doesn't sound like something they would do. And then that's something they did. We do that too. I can't believe what I just did. I can't believe that I said that. And yet you said it. Like we always sh shock ourselves with our, with, our, with our own sin. It's not like that with God. So the analogy is limited. But just like there's a level of trust before you jump into it, must be a mistake, must be error. Take that approach with scripture. When you hear something you don't understand that sounds like a mistake, be mature, be calm, just chill. Say, I'm going to investigate that. Now, your confidence has to be already resting on Scripture, where you know that can't be an error, but that doesn't mean you immediately know the answer or even find the answer, but you start there. Your starting place is God cannot err. God cannot lie. Why? Because God's very nature is truth. So his word tells us the truth. John 17, 17, Jesus says to the Father, your word is truth. I used to have a friend, whenever uh, we wouldn't believe what he would say, he would go, Lord's truth, son, Lord's truth. This Puerto Rican kid from New York, he'd always say, Lord's truth, son. Right? It was a way, of, you shouldn't probably really be saying that. It's kind of like uh, probably taking God's name in vain type of thing. But what he was trying to say, Manny, my friend, he was trying to say, this right here, this is like God said it, right? Which is why you shouldn't really say that kind of thing. But we understood what he was trying to do. I'm, I'm not making this up. I'm not lying. And there's 
a reason why that has an impact is because God's word is truth. It's infallible. Next slide, I've already mentioned. It's inerrant. I know these are not words we use every day. These are theological terms, but we come to learn and we come to grow. And I think all of us, even if we've never heard the word before, infallible, inerrant, we can understand the concept. Scripture is free from error, free from all falsehood, fraud, or, de or deceit. There's a summation of the doctrine of Scripture that I think is really good. It's called the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. I've actually got a couple here where I printed out the points and you can see that it's a summation. When we say the Bible is infallible, what do we mean? When we say the Bible is inerrant, what are we saying there? Ultimately, this scripture is completely truthful. Again, John Frame, it has a level of precision sufficient for its own purposes, not for the purposes for which some readers might employ it. Meaning you also take the Bible in its own context for it being as precise as it needs to be. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, there's a question about, the, the length of time that the Israelites were in Egypt. Sometimes scripture seems to say 400. Other times it seems to say 430. There's some debates about the length of the so sojourn in Egypt there. It appears that 400 is simply rounding it down to what it is, which it appears, this is my estimation or understanding at this point right now, that it's ultimately 430 years as far as the actual time, but 400. And by the way, they weren't slaves the whole time. They were not, sometimes we think four, it's 400 years, 430 years technically of being in Egypt, but they were not enslaved the whole time. There's a time where they became slaves. The 430 refers to the whole time, right? It's just important. So it's important to understand because sometimes like in 10 commandments, you know, where you got a bunch of white Egyptians, right? 10 commandments. We've been enslaved for 400 years. No, they weren't enslaved for 40 years. They've been in Egypt about 400, 430, but part of that time was a slavery. Anyway, that's a small rabbit trail, but the point is, we understand the Bible is saying 400. It's still accurate because we understand what it's doing. It's rounding it down there. That's an example. So if we understand that, it's precise as what it needs to be for what it is trying to say. Scripture is clear. The technical name for this is the perspicuity of Scripture. Perspicuity or the clarity of Scripture. In brief, you can make sense of Scripture. You can make sense of the Bible. Yeah, but you just said there's parts I don't understand. What do you mean? And there's parts of the Bible even says are hard. Yes, but the main and plain things are main and plain. That's why when we explain the message of the Bible, the Bible to a child, if they're to be normally functioning, they can understand the essence of what we're saying to them. There's a reason for that. Because the big idea is clear. The big ideas are there. The Bible sometimes has multiple statements about this issue over here and only one or two statements about this issue over here. So we'll have a whole bunch of data to collate, okay, what does the Bible say on this topic versus maybe one or two scriptures, right? Like, for example, it's only in a few places where the Bible says something that's kind of fascinating. Paul says that the law of Moses was, was mediated through angels, what exactly does that mean? That's a sort of a debated question about what, is, what does Paul mean when he says mediated through angels? There's only a few places where you can look to say, I think this is talking about, this is talking about. Verse, if, if I say this, who is Jesus Christ? The Bible has a lot about who Jesus is. And it's not even just in the Gospels. It's in the epistles. It's in Revelation. It's in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. It's all over. I could write a bigger book on the, the second topic, right? You could You would have more to understand. But have a confidence. Let me show you this. This should empower you where you say, okay, God meant for his word to be understood. And so this level of confidence you have going forward. It doesn't mean you understand it immediately. That's what Bible study is all about. <laughs> if it was immediately everything simply understood, then it would be so basic. It would not hold our interest. It would not be something for adults, right? Scripture is clear, though, in the main and plain things. Let me read from the Westminster Confession again. All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in a due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. That's summarizing what I was saying, just in more technical language. That's what it's saying. And so this is this is important to understand because it means when you have a an issue or challenge, you can know that there's 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 a solution.
And last thing I'll say on this, remember Jesus in his debates with Pharisees or the, the, the people of his day, the scribes? They'd be like, oh, what about this, right? He would say, have you not read? He would say something like that. He never said, well, I know it's really hard to understand here and, you know, I, you just don't get it. He would always put the error essentially on the user. You know, like in computers, we talk about user error. The error comes from our own sin, our own lack of knowledge. And I think that's part of why Paul says we see through a glass darkly lit still, right? And the error we is on our side, not God's side. And so we say, okay, God, what are you saying here? Next, characteristic of Scripture, Scripture is sufficient. Scripture contains all the divine words needed for any aspect of human life. Scripture is sufficient to reveal God, save and teach one to live righteously. And that's really a summation of what 2 Timothy 3.16 is all about. This is what's called the sufficiency of Scripture. Let me read again here from the Westminster Confession of Faith. I know it's kind of small up there. But uh, in regards to the sufficiency of, of Scripture, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. That means figuring out through pro process of apl applying logic and reasoning to it unto which. Nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary. That's saying when you read it, how God will sometimes make things clear to you. That's called illumination. Have you ever had that happen? You've been reading Scripture, and you're like, how did I not see this before? It's almost like God took a highlighter and went, you feel like that ever? That's illumination. Or you see something like, I didn't understand this two years ago. This is incredibly obvious now. I understand this. Let me be frank. If if when I talk about some of these things, if you don't understand, if you don't, I'm like, I don't. If you're if you're thinking I don't relate, most likely it probably means you're not studying Scripture enough. It probably means your your habits and your devotions are not where they need to be, because this is the experience of of honestly every Christian. And and uh, let me continue on here for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word, and that. There are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and governments of the church common to human actions and societies, which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. It's saying there are some things that we do in prudence or in wisdom, applying basic principles of Scripture, in which it may be influenced by, by culture that is not sinful culture or by something that's necessary, meaning the Bible doesn't say if we should have chairs in our church. It doesn't tell us what time to start church, it does the service. It doesn't say whether we should use amplification or not. But you see, see things like that, right? The Bible doesn't say thou shalt have a website. It doesn't say thou shalt not have a website either. That Those kinds of things. But for what it needs to talk about, it's sufficient to talk about those things. Scripture is necessary. It is necessary. This is the last attribute of Scripture we're going to talk about here. It is necessary. Grudem says this, the Bible is necessary for knowing the gospel, for maintaining spiritual life, and for knowing God's will. But it is not necessary for knowing that God exists or for knowing something about God's character and moral laws. So this is the difference of special revelation and general revelation. Looking at creation, we know there's a creator. And even there's an internal, not just an external witness that you might call conscience. We do something wrong. We feel as if someone sees us as if we're being watched and yet no one's around. And then if we're properly morally functioning, a sense of guilt, of shame, which modern psych psychotherapy tells you is bad. Guilt and shame are bad. The Bible says there's some things we should be guilty and ashamed about, right? And so... That is something we know, even if there was no Bible. There are some things you could know, but you can't know everything. This is Romans 1. It says you'll know this, but not that. So you'll know God is powerful when you see something like the Grand Canyon, although it's ultimately, I believe, created by a process of the flood. But you still can look out and see the beauty and understand God is powerful. God is big. Or you can see an elephant, or if you would have been able to see way back in the day, a dinosaur, God is powerful. God is big. Who made this, right? Or you see the butterfly or the hawk flying, and it does so perfectly as if it was designed to do that thing. You see a dolphin, you see a killer whale going through the water as if it was made to do what it's doing. 
There's a beauty in that. And we know there is a God, internal witness, external witness, but scripture alone provides special revelation, knowledge of God's will and salvation. We don't know just by looking at the beauty of the sun or the sunset or the sunrise, if the guy who made that, the God who made that, the designer, we don't know if he's communicated with us. Has he talked to us? Did he just set up creation and then peace out? That's why the Bible speaks about Jesus in such a way that he's the express revelation. He's saying here's exactly what it is. But it's not just Jesus. Hebrews 1 tells us that God has spoken lots of ways in the past through prophets and all that. And now in the final days, the last days, through Jesus. So God has communicated. That's why we believe so heavily in Bible translation to get the word of God to people in their language. That matters to us because we understand Look, this is what God has said. So we don't force everyone to learn Greek and Hebrew. We don't force everyone to learn English or Spanish. We say, let's bring the word of God to you. That's why we care about Bible translation. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to support. Winding down now, how to study, trust, and believe the scripture. Trust and believe the scripture. Let's go to 2 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter. This will be our last uh, verse we look at in depth. I got one more after this, but this is our last one in depth. This is also towards the end of your Bibles, right before First John, Second Peter. So I've looked at a letter by the Apostle Paul. Now let's look at a letter by the Apostle Peter. Second Peter chapter one. Look at what he says here, starting in verse sixteen. Verse sixteen. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's saying this is not some clever fairy tale. This is not a cleverly concocted scheme to make you feel better about yourself. This is history. And Peter's saying, and we saw it. We know what we're talking about. We were there. So someone can say, well, I don't believe in miracles. But when you see a real miracle, it doesn't matter if you believe in miracles. God has acted in history in a miraculous way. We were eyewitnesses. I saw this. Now, we weren't there. That's why it's been written down so we can read about the people who did see it. Verse 17. For when he received honor, this is speaking of Jesus Christ. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice Voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Most likely, Peter there is referring to what's sometimes called the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus sort of let down his, uh, his shield, and you're able to, they were able to see more really fully who he was in his radiance and glory. Jesus, despite some of those old Bible movies you might see, he didn't walk around levitating on earth. He didn't have a, a soul glow, so you would know right away, oh, he wasn't an alien. He didn't have a natural halo follow him. He was like a normal guy. Judas didn't say, hey, yeah, the, the guy with the halo, that's the one. He had to kiss him to, so they could know who it was, right? He was a normal guy, a carpenter. And that's why when uh, he came to Nazareth, they're like, isn't this like Joseph's son? Like this guy, who does he think he is? Talking about he fulfills prophecy, right? He, there's a sense of a very normal plainness, and yet Peter says we saw his majesty. They saw, and that is the way the Bible describes Jesus at the end. In Revelation 1, you read about the description of Jesus. It's majestic. We ourselves heard. So notice there Peter talks about something we saw, and now he says something we heard. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain i was there this is different than muhammad going into a cave saying that gabriel spoke to him this is different than joseph smith going to the woods saying that personages appeared to him because it's just one guy saying guess what happened to me there's multiple eyewitnesses who saw this peter was one of them but notice he says we we ourselves and we, verse 19, have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Everything prophesied in the Old Testament, we saw come to pass. Not everything, but the things about Jesus' first coming, the Messiah's first coming. We saw them. It's more sure than it even was before. The prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention. So pay attention to God's word, everyone. As to a lamp shining in a dark place. That's what the Bible is like for us. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, 
knowing, and now this is the key right here, verse 20, watch this, knowing this first of all, this is fundamental, this has got priority, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. He's saying it's not nearly a private matter. He's saying that hum mere humans are not the ultimate source. That's what he's saying there. Look at verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's sort of a navigational term that carried along, a nautical term where you would have a, a like a sailboat and it'll have its it's a sails up and then we would push it and blow it. That's sort of what he's saying there. He's saying here are the people here. They are and the Holy spirit has moved them along to write what they write. He's not denying men in the process of inscripturation, but he's saying that's not all it is. That's not the ultimate source. That's what he's saying there. And there's other places where we can see this kind of thing. But it's fascinating. Peter agrees with Paul, and Paul agrees with Peter, and yet they so say it in their, their own way. And so we end talking about how to learn, study the Scripture. Study the Scripture. That's what I've really been pounding in the whole time, but I'm trying to inspire you to encourage you about why you should want to study the Scripture, why it's important. Let's go to the next slide, please. Study the Scripture. Briefly, let me give you a couple pointers about how to study the Scripture, how to study the Bible. Next slide, please. Maybe this is, out of all the ones, I would say this is probably one of the best ones to take a picture of. It might be the most helpful, I would say. I know it's, I wish it, it's a little small. You could come up there, take a picture, whatever. I think this is helpful right here. Some, some tips about how to study the Bible. Firstly, read and reread the passage. Observe details. So you read it, the section, and then read it again. And so sometimes it is good to go through like the whole Bible in a year. But when you do that, a lot of times you, you have to take in big chunks at once. And, and that's OK. That's OK, because that's very helpful because it gives you the big idea, the big picture of Scripture. But there's other times where you want to just sit with a section. So, say, for example, you know what's going to be being preached on Sunday and you sit with that before and after the sermon. And that's what you're looking at. And then you hear it expounded further Sunday. So read, re read the passage and then observe details. Almost like you're investigating. Secondly, ask this question. Who is speaking to who and why? Sometimes you can know this. It will say, from Paul to Timothy. Okay, Paul is speaking to Timothy. And, and you may say, I'm not sure why yet, but it's helpful if you can know. For example, Jude says, I was going to write about this, but I got to write about this because there's a bunch of false teachers. So, you know, John at the end of his gospel says, I wrote so you can have salvation. So, okay, the purpose of this. And it's not just there's one purpose a lot of times, but you kind of say, what's the larger purpose of this? Three, what is the main subject? So there's a main subject of the Bible, ultimately God. And there's a main subject of any given book. And then there's a main subject of any pericope or section of scripture. And so the idea is this section of scripture you're looking at, what is the main thing we're discussing? There may be two or three main things. You write those down. You say, okay, it looks like the main thing we're talking about is this here. It looks like the main thing we're talking about is meat sacrifice to idols. Or you may go more abstract with that same topic. It looks like the main thing we're talking about here is Christian freedom. Look at another section. It looks like the main thing we're talking about here is the nature of God. Look at another section say some of the passages we just read, looks like the main thing we're talking about here is the Bible itself, Scripture itself. You see what I'm saying? Main subject. Fourthly, and this is a challenging right here, bridge the gaps. So everything I've talked about so far, you can do really without any other tools other than Scripture itself. The next one is where you start to develop some Bible study tools because to bridge the gaps in regards to language, culture, and history – might be a couple tools, and maybe just one for each. You might get uh, what's called the, there's there's some books out now, the cultural commentary in the Bible. It'll explain some of the things about some of the cultural elements that are relevant back then, because we're separated by time and space from these people, right? So we may not always understand immediately. Other things historically, like okay, it says Tiberius Caesar. Who's that? Right. Who is. Well, that's that's where other sources come into play, like a Bible dictionary, for example, would help you with that. For example, Bible encyclopedia, perhaps one volume set, multi volume set language. 
start with a concordance. Now, we're in the internet ed- age, and a lot of the stuff, you don't even necessarily have to buy something for it. You can go to blueletterbible.com or bible.org, and you can even say, okay, what's going on with a language here? Let's say you look at something in the ESV, and then you don't understand it, so then you look at it at the NIV, and the translations are somewhat different. That's where you may say, why are they translating it different? That's where you can go to look at the underlying Greek or Hebrew. And again, we're in a beautiful age. You can get Bible software like Logos Bible software, or you can use stuff online, or more old school traditional classic is Strong's Concordance. These things are things that help you as you grow and have an arsenal. It's just like, you know, I'm not really a handyman, but uh, for people who know how to do things like fix cars and work around the house, you start off and you maybe have one or two things. You got a hammer, you got a nail, you got a wrench. You might have a socket wrench. And over time, you're like, oh, let me get that power saw. Oh, let me get that power drill. You start to develop an arsenal for the craft. It's like that with Bible study. And, and again, we're blessed. Maybe you don't have shelf space. The internet can be very helpful. But you got you to gotta know trustworthy sources also with that because that's thing you know you're on jw.org about how to study the Bible, the Jehovah's Witnesses website. You're like, oh, here's a great website I found. Look at this. Look at their discussion about the Trinity, right? Not so much. Fifthly, how does this, the part you're looking at, connect to the big story and to Christ? So why in the world, for example, is uh, Philemon in the Bible? It's a letter about Paul talking to someone about a runaway slave. What about the Song of Solomon? It's like a man and a woman spitting bars at each other, like love poems. Your neck is like the Lebanon of Cedar, you know, this kind of stuff, right? Your eyes are like goat's milk, you know, that kind of stuff, right? What's going on? How does that connect to the larger story of the Scripture? Well, to do that, you got to know the larger story of Scripture. So before you get lost or bogged down in detail, say, what is the overall picture of Scripture? And especially the Christ connection. I'm not saying that every little word points to Christ, but all the Bible ultimately points to Christ in some way. Some are more explicit. Some are more loose. But you ask yourself, how does this connect? And and you can tell that these things can take a while. So the more you know of other places, then you say, Oh, so that's how Micah 5, 2 connects to the birthplace of Jesus Christ. And you start to see things and put it together. And then lastly, you synthesize it all. You put it all together. And then you say, how do I apply it? The practical application. This means that I should be giving regularly. This means that I should right? This means that we should, should not. This means that I should think this way about this. This means I should help my neighbor. That You apply once you have an understanding. And so there's a danger where, you know, sometimes we'll just jump immediately to application. 20 lessons from the Bible about how to save your marriage. But if we don't really do the underlying work, we're not really seeing how it directly connects. And you want a church where the pastor tries to model this, the teachers try to model this, but ultimately... You're a man, you're a woman, you're an adult. This is stuff we got to learn how to do in ourselves. We're not just saying pastor has all the answer, come to him. And then this is something we got to learn how to, you can sometimes call and talk. That's true. But ultimately, guys, we're in community, but also we got to take responsibility. And then you can teach others after you yourself have studied. Let's end with a devotional verse from Psalms. Psalm 119 is the largest chapter in the Bible. And it's very beautiful on what it says, where you see a love expressed for God's word. The whole thing is filled with this. It'll take you like 30 minutes to read Psalm 119. Depends how, you know, your reading time. But it'll take you a while to read it. It's a big, big chunk. This is like verse 159 and verse 160. That's a lot of verses, right? And look at what is said here. Consider how I love your precepts. Sometimes we don't always feel like we love God's word. Pray, God, help me to love your word and have a passion for you. Give me life according to your steadfast love. You understand the source of life is scripture. You understand the love of God is found in scripture. The sum of your word is truth. There's that emphasis again. When God speaks, it's true by definition of who he is. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. This is just a way to say the Bible lasts. The Bible stays. Everyone endures forever. And it's the only thing, you know, Homer was one of the most popular Greek poets. How many of you can recite Homer to me? 
Shakespeare, one of the most popular English poets, yet we probably know some of you might know to be or not to be. And then you kind of, that's all you got, right? The Bible lasts forever, all generation, all ages, all times. And so when we talk about how to be wise, how to study, it's by turning to scripture. Scripture. 